Good morning, Dr. Rushing. Uh, if you could tell us a little about your background, including birthplace education, family background, uh, etc. Just give us a little overview of that, where you were born, dates. Would be good. Well, I was born uh, 90 years ago today in uh, rural Brown County up in Central Texas, of course, uh, to a, a young farming couple. Uh, we lived out uh, in the east part of Brown County. Uh, I was the first child, and uh, my father suffered uh, asthma, so farming wasn't for him. And very shortly after I was born, we moved to Comanche. He uh, went to work with his uncle in a small retail grocery, community grocery type thing. And he was also post office messenger in uh, Comanche, meaning he carried the mail between the railroad and, and the, the, the uh, post office in those days. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, in college, I had the same job in Brownwood for about two or three years. Uh, we moved shortly after I was born to Comanche where you had to be seven years old to start the public school. And uh, I was uh, six in 1927 and there was a small kindergarten and my parents sent me to this kindergarten in 1927. And uh, that's where I got my first formal education. Uh, my father died during that year. We moved back out uh, to Brown County to live with my maternal grandparents. And uh, my first public school was a little country school called Antioch. And this was back in the day when a county commissioner's court could uh, establish a school in the crossroads where there was a need for students. And I went to Antioch school, 18 pupils, little two-room school. The day my mother took me to sign up, she carried a little piece of paper that Mrs. Holmes, the kindergarten teacher, had given her her when the year was over, and the two young teachers looked at that, the Antioch teachers, they looked at that and decided I ought to be in the second grade. So my first experience in public education was skipping the first grade, and uh, I suppose it didn't hurt me much. I, I seemed to compensate for that somewhere along the way. I went to the blanket school after the consolidation of the Antioch and graduated in 1938. and. Uh, an 11th grade school. Uh, I played on the first football team that Blanket ever had, 1937. We won one game. Uh, not a huge record. And uh, I started Howard Payne College in the fall of 1938. I really had signed up to go to a business college in Brownwood, uh, where you went, you know, for nine months and you were trained enough to go out and get a job as a file clerk or something like that. But uh, the pastor of my little Baptist church out there in East Brown County uh, was a Howard Payne student, and he convinced me all to go to Howard Payne, and, and, and that's where I went. And attended school there at Howard Payne over a period of four years, uh, edited the yearbook two of those years, and World War II came along. And uh, uh, I managed to get in the service after several tries, uh, and got a, I finally got a waiver to get in. And when I came back uh, from the service, I uh, only had to go to school a few weeks to uh, get my degree. So that pretty much sums up my, uh, bring me up through the early years. But uh, basically, I, uh, uh, I'm a small town guy that uh, enjoy being in that, in that kind of category. Can you tell us just a brief a little bit about your military service? Uh, 1940s. Of course, war clouds are developing in, in Europe, and uh, I had always been interested in the military. When I graduated from high school, I got a, a little scholarship to Shriner Institute, and I wanted to go there, but just because of the uniform, I, I was being kind of infatuated with that, but uh, couldn't, couldn't do that. And when the uh, country began rearming in 1940-41, uh, I tried every branch of the service to get into the reserve, as many college students did, and I flunked all the exams. Even the draft board didn't want me. So uh, I heard of a program the Army was starting 
in specialized training. And I uh, decided to try to hitchhike to Abilene, to the recruiting office. I got there, they gave me the physical, filled out all the forms, gave me an examination of some sort of thing I call. And then advised me that I was turned down because uh, I couldn't see out of my left eye. Well, as the Army officer was telling me that I was denied enlistment, another officer walked by and he said, by the way, he said, can't we take some people in that program on limited service? And uh, they looked it up in the reg. Yes, they could. He said, would you take limited service? I took anything. So I walked out of there with my ID card, which is back on the side of my computer, I think now, uh, listed me as Private Joe Bob Rushing in the Air Force, in, in the Army Reserve. And uh, went to basic training while I was there. The Army did away with limited service, service so I walked out of basic training as uh, classified as a rifleman. Went to, uh, was assigned to a division, and the day I got there, they apparently just needed someone in one of their medical detachments. And I, with, with uh, my background in chemistry, maybe they saw that. And uh, they made a medic out of me. And I did that throughout my Army career through World War II. I was a medic with the anti-tank company of the 342nd Infantry in Europe. And uh, our division was sent to Europe primarily, well, entirely because of the Battle of Bulge in December of 1916, uh, excuse me, December 16, 1945, when the Germans attacked through the Ardennes Forest. Uh, we were on, in California training for the Pacific in the invasion of Japan. Shipped us over across countries in troop trains and ships to Europe. And I was in Europe for about, about a the last hundred days of the war there. Then the first division brought back and we deployed to the Pacific, but they dropped the atom bomb on the way to the Pacific. So what I did was spend seven months in the Philippines, uh, now in uh, medical supply, and my job was primarily to deliver medical supplies to Filipino Army units up in the hills on Luzon, things of that sort. So I had a a pretty broad experience in the military, but uh, I can't say it was spectacular in any sense of the word. Very interesting history, military history. Now, and when uh, you, uh, I might add too that uh, when the Korean War broke out in, in 1950, I had just begun my doctoral program at the University of Texas, and I thought, well, uh, they may call me back to active duty for some reason, so I went down to, to the recruiting office, Air Force recruiting office, uh, got the application forms, went back out to my dormitory, filled out the application form, and uh, was proofreading it, and I saw the, the, uh, the blank where it said, for what rank, rank are you applying? I had written down second lieutenant, and I thought, hey, I started at the bottom last time, didn't get very far, I got to corporal. I erased that and put down first lieutenant. They gave it to me. So I, I spent 21 years in the Air Force Reserve. So when you got back from the war, you went to, uh, you, do you use the GI Bill and went to graduate yes. school? Tell us a little bit about your graduate school experience, and then we'll get back okay. to your childhood right. briefly. I, uh, uh, in, in 1942, when I enlisted, I was much closer to a bachelor's degree than I realized. And when I came back, I enrolled in Howard Payne in the summer school of 1946. They had a nine-week summer term. And uh, I enrolled in, in a full course load on the GI Bill. Uh, in September, 1st of September, no, 1st of, uh, of uh, August, I went to the dean's office to check my records to see what I had to take I thought I had to go one more semester. And the dean uh, checked my records, and uh, I think there may have been some degree uh, changes, and I mean the degree requirement changes, and uh, some journalism had not been placed on my record from my yearbook editing. And so when he had finished getting all that recorded, he said, Rushing, you just graduated. He said, go over to the office somewhere over there on the campus and get you a cap and gown. 
And so that night I walked across stage and got a Bachelor of Arts degree. <laughs> and then uh, uh, I had no intention of teaching, and but stumbled into it accidentally and uh, decided I would go into, I wanted to be in the school administration. Uh, as a chemistry teacher, I loved it, but uh, if anybody was making any money, it was a principal down the hall. Well, I certainly wasn't. So I moved into co to, uh, school administration, discovered the uh, community college when I became principal at Ranger, Texas, and uh, went to the University of Texas. Uh, I had earned my master's degree in East, East Texas while teaching over in Mount Pleasant. And uh, so I went to the University of Texas after learning about community colleges. I spent two full years and got a Ph.D. It sounds like you had an interesting background and, and a, you had kind of an adventurous spirit. So you, as, as a child, who influenced you, do you think? Who were you, do you have heroes as a child, people you look up to, admire, that it influenced? Well, in terms of he heroes, of course, I'm maybe with all children, your first heroes are fictional. And uh, I, I lived out in the country on the farm. We had... We had very limited reading material in the house. We got the Brownwood Bulletin every day, a day late. It came out by train, I guess, from uh, Brownwood to Zephyr in, on a rural route. And uh, I, re I was an avid reader of the comics, and I remember uh, a comic strip called Wash and Easy, two characters who were always uh, in some kind of venture somewhere, Captain Easy and a fellow named uh, Wash Tubbs. And uh, they were my two heroes. And then later on, uh, I got interested in, in boxing as a, as a youngster. And uh, I read everything I could find about Jack Dempsey and Jack Johnson. And Joe Lewis, of course, uh, uh, came into the picture. And as a matter of fact, the, the first sports event I ever heard on the radio, and we had just gotten a radio, we had no electricity at that time out there, so we had an old battery-powered radio, was the Joe lewis Max Schmeling fight. Uh, I've forgotten what year it was. 37, but, I think. But uh, Joe Lewis uh, decimated the Schmeling in the first round. and That was the first sporting event I remember on, on, uh, on the radio. But uh, I, those boxers are my heroes. I, I composed poetry about them even when I was a little old kid. And then... Uh, uh, very early, I developed an uh, interest in the history of Texas. And, of course, uh, I was a great admirer of all the people of the Alamo and Travis and Crockett and, of course, Sam Houston and all those. They were people that uh, I uh, sort of idolized. Well, you couldn't grow up in Texas without speaking as a native Texan. Without, without, uh, that's in, right. You know, that's just in your blood. It sounds like you had a, a, a an early interest in in uh, community college education, so you were kind of uh, almost destined for this position at TCJC. Um, take a minute to compare and contrast the environment of TCJC that existed when you took the helm as first chancellor and the college today. When you came on board, of course, there was no college at all and you you were there for the actual construction of the first campus and and you uh, supervised the beginning of the uh, of the latest campus uh, the uh, the Arlington campus which is southeast so uh, you were I, there my, from, my last campus to be involved in the planning and construction was northwest northwest and after I retired then that's when the development of this the uh, southeast campus came along. Yeah, so you saw the college develop yes, from right. all through these various. So, so what, you know, compare the early stages with the institution right. as it as it evolved. Well, my interest in, in uh, community colleges, and then we call all of us call them junior college because uh, all Texas legislation was written in terms of junior college, back from 1941 when the first appropriate appropriate the first money, but. Uh, <clears throat> I knew very little about them, and when I got my first administrative job as principal of a school in Ranger, and in being interviewed, they'd made the decision to, to employ me, and I had made the decision to accept, and the superintendent of schools, who was also president of college, said, oh, by the way, uh, we notice you have a, a degree, undergraduate degree in chemistry. 
we'll want you to go out to college at night and teach a chemistry class. This was in Ranger. And uh, that's where I really got decided that's where I wanted to be because I could I found out what was happening across the country. New ones being started everywhere. And that's what got me at the University of Texas and uh, the uh, the community college movement. And that's where I was really converted to that uh, belief. And uh, so far as the the uh, atmosphere or the climate in uh, Tarrant County, uh, it was really, I would call it anticipatory because in the campaign that you've you, I know I've read about uh, a lot of people were involved. Uh, community leaders, many of them who worked behind the scenes pretty much, but uh, service groups, uh, all for many, many committees, people who to take carry the message. The Fort Worth Star Telegram ran 13 articles, a series of 13 articles describing junior colleges turning those days. Harley Pershing was his name. And uh, Somewhere I have those uh, 13 articles somewhere. Tom Schieffer was a junior in Arlington Heights High School and president-elect of the uh, uh, student body out there for his senior year. And he organized a speakers group of high school seniors or juniors and seniors to go out to, to peer four groups. So the community had been just literally saturated with information. That didn't mean everybody got the word, but there was a great deal of anticipation about what this new college would be. And when I arrived there in uh, November of 1965, uh, just about every day I was before some group somewhere uh, explaining what, the, what I've envisioned, what the board envisioned the college would be like, what uh, curriculum would be. One of the interesting things, that the question came up that uh, the college had been sold largely on the basis of its impact on the economy, technical education, career education. And I'd, I'd almost always get a question in those early weeks, uh, I don't suppose you'll have anything like art and music. And my response was always this, uh, any institution that does not uh, emphasize the arts and the humanities uh, doesn't deserve the name college. And we started off in the very beginning with uh, very strong programs in those fields. So it. It was, it was really a great experience uh, to face the community and, and try to interpret what the, the leadership had uh, uh, envisioned when they called for the election to, to form the college district. So it sounds like your vision of a community college was um, pretty much what it became. It was, and and it, it's a kind of a gateway to higher learning and, and not trade school, which right. is kind of what yes. people envisioned. And, and that was a, well, I, f I faced that when I first arrived there because that was a good selling point. The career training, trade school type uh, was was really stressed, but uh, I think we had to develop the, the, the concept of a comprehensive uh, community college. So if a young person today asks you about the importance of attending college, uh, or the importance of the humanities as part of a college education. Uh, say somebody that had some questions about the value of a college education, how would you respond? Uh, I would not respond as I would have a number of years ago when you could say, look, if you go to college and get a degree, you can earn this more dollars than uh, if you just stopped in high school. Uh, I, I would I certainly have always encouraged people to to go to college in whatever form it might be, not just simply to get a credential of some sort, uh, a degree or, or a certificate, which those are important. But uh, I, to me, it's, it, as much as anything, it's, uh, it's developing a, a habit of lifelong learning and uh, not to, to stop at any certain point with a degree or, or a document uh, certifying your expertise in some field. Uh, I think that's, to me, that's one of the most important things. I, uh, I still haven't broken my habit of going to college, and I, I took two classes this last year at, at Texas A&M Central Texas. My history, uh, my military history uh, uh, in, interest uh, overcame everything else, and I audited a course in uh, European history 1919 to 1945, and a course in uh, the spring I did a course in uh, U.S. military history. So uh, 
uh, yeah, at 90 you can still uh, go to school if you want to. This, uh, this next question is, gets us kind of back to the notion of heroes, maybe in a more contemporary sense. If you had an opportunity to invite anyone, living or dead, to a dinner party, who would you invite and why and what would be on the menu? To pick somebody to invite for dinner, anybody I could, I could have, that's the toughest question you've proposed yet. <laughs> Anything else I can, uh, I can talk about it, but I really had to get some thought to that. And, you know, being with my interest in the military, uh, you think of George Patton and uh, Dwight Eisenhower and Audie Murphy and uh, any number of names. Uh, Winston Churchill would always come to mind. Uh, I thought about uh, Carl Sandburg and, and, and the way he could use words in, uh, in describing, for example, uh, Lincoln's funeral train back to Springfield, very moving document. As a matter of fact, I've, I've just a couple of years ago, I reread all of, uh, of uh, Sandberg's uh, Lincoln series. Uh, and, uh, of course, there are religious figures in the past and, and present. You think of the people you'd like to meet face to face. But I ended up with one that probably wouldn't be the greatest dinner guest. And I, I guess this this grew out of the fact that uh, of what we're facing in the country today and it's the problems where we have both financial and, and sociological uh, I picked John Adams uh, John Adams uh, was not as I said he might not have been the most pleasant dinner guest uh, a professor of mine one of the greatest professors I ever had was Newton Edwards many many years University of Chicago history department and then uh, Fortunate for me, he finished up his career at the University of Texas, and I was able to have two classes with him. And I remember the day that Dr. Edwards said, uh, the Ad no other family, more than the Adams family, contributed to, to uh, the nation as we know it today. But nobody was ever so unpleasant about it. Sam and, and uh, John and John Quincy, they weren't exactly uh, uh, personality people, but uh, I thought about John Adams and... Uh, his uh, struggles to get loans from Netherlands and France and uh, spent months and months and years away from his family and uh, was always a stabilizing force uh, in, uh, in politics and as the Congress was, was shaping up. Uh, disagreed with a lot of people uh, that would be, I guess, considered liberals in those days. Uh, I would like to have uh, had over a luncheon table or dinner table uh, ask him what he really thought about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, they had a great correspondence, mostly a uh, John Adams doing the writing, but uh, and uh, what his relationship was with George Washington uh, during the time he was Vice President George Washington. And so I think that would have been uh, my choice if, if I had that, and just to see what John Adams would think about uh, contemporary United States of America. Adams, they were a difficult family. Yeah. There's a book uh, about John Quincy called Arguing About Slavery. Are you, are you familiar with that? No, I have not seen that. I would recommend that. It, uh, it's a, he, he was the defense counsel for the uh, yes. slave ship. Right, yes. It's a, it's a brilliant book about the, uh, his involvement in the anti-slavery. Oh, movement. and I, I did see the documentary on that, I believe. Yeah, yes. That's, that made me think of that. When you met him. He was a difficult man. <laughs> right. Uh, Last question about your kind of your legacy. How, how would you like to be uh, remembered? Uh, and I would broaden that into you know, looking back on your career as an educator, what would you consider your most important contributions and, and the most satisfying aspects of your work? Uh, a lot of good things. Uh, and looking back and, uh, on, the, on the career and uh, how I would like to. Uh, to be remembered, uh, I think to sum it up, I would say, I'd like to be remembered as someone who made a difference, uh, particularly in the field of the community college. And uh, I don't mean by that that you know, built several campuses and was a founding uh, 
CEO of two, two colleges, two of the best ones in the country today. Uh, that's, that's a great satisfaction, but I think that uh, more than that, I like to think that I made some contribution to uh, enabling other people to become leaders in the field. And I'm talking about Armand Johnson, I'm talking about C.A. Robertson, I'm talking about Don Newberry, uh, Jan LaCroix, uh, and several others who uh, came to us, stayed for a while, and I hope uh, I was somewhat of a mentor to them. And they went out to make their impact, and I think that it was, it's kind of a multiplying uh, factor, and, and I, I think that's uh, uh, probably the most satisfying. Another thing that's been very satisfying to me, and I worked with boards, community college boards for 30 years. And that was always a great relationship because uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I would last long in uh, college administration today. But uh, we always, boards and I always had clear understanding of our roles. And some board members over the years really helped me to understand that. When I was named president of Broward Community College in Fort Lauderdale, to go down and start that little college in 1960, I had just for the first time had a lengthy conversation with uh, Dr. Walter Prescott Webb, University of Texas. I never had a class with Dr. Webb when I was down there, but I had met him and had heard him speak a few times. And uh, he and I had breakfast one morning and uh, just because uh, the restaurant was full and he had an empty space at his table, he asked me to join him. And he mailed me a copy of the University of Texas Graduate Quarterly. And it contained the speech that Dr. Webb had given at the inauguration of Jack Wolf at the University of Texas Arlington. And he named the speech, and I may still have that catalog somewhere. This was, we're talking 1959, 60. Uh, he entitled the speech, Man on the Seesaw. And he depicted the college president as standing in the middle of a seesaw and the faculty on one end and the board of uh, trustees or board of regents on the other and the president's most important job to oversimplify was to keep those two separated. Not separated physically, but separated in terms of understanding of their roles. And, and I enjoyed that, I think, uh, throughout the 30 years as, as my college presidenting. One last thing to kind of sum things up. You, you, uh, your experience, your professional experience with the community college world kind of traces the, it, from its early beginnings, I mean it had been around for a while, but in, uh, and now uh, uh, the community college is being, is kind of coming to its own. Right. So you've seen it evolve into something quite probably different from in the early years. So. Um, what, do you, what do you see in store for the future of the community college as an institution in its role, its well, special role in the future? For, for a number of reasons. Now, I'll say this when I retired. I really retired. And uh, I began raising cattle and, and doing nothing and, and uh, have not really kept up with things, but I do watch it very carefully from the outside and keep, have a keen interest. Uh, we still have some of the same problems that, that uh, community colleges have had since their, their existence, you know. Uh, we have those uh, ideas that it's junior to something. Uh, I won't ever quite forgive the guy who came up with that term junior, but uh, it, it, it had that stigma for a very long time. We've gotten rid of that. And uh, I think now more and more, particularly people in policy positions, are seeing this as really, uh, it is a unique segment of American education. You know, we've got the graduate school from Europe, we've got the elementary schools from Europe, secondary schools, but the community college is, is a unique American institution. And I think that's being more and more recognized. We're getting more and more people who have that experience in, in Tarrant County, how many thousands of people do you have who have had a direct experience with Tarrant County College? Thousands of them. And uh, I think that uh, as time goes on, and economic pressures are part of this too, uh, the, the college, uh, the two-year college, is going to become far more important than it is now, and more and more people are going to go into it.
Uh, we still have the problem in this nation of, uh, I think it's more of a parental problem than it is a student problem, of uh, people who have a desire to see their offspring, and this is high, laudable, I don't uh, crit criticize this, uh, having a degree from a quality institution. And uh, sometimes I think they don't really understand the word quality. Uh, but I think more and more people, more and more people are going to see the community college as being a high quality uh, in institution. And so uh, I've physicians suggested from time to time that maybe what we ought to do when uh, a couple has a new baby, uh, let, give, give them a, a bachelor's degree from the college of their choice and then from that point on we worry about the education. But that's, of course, uh, doesn't work. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Rushing. Appreciate your time. Well, thank you for coming down. Enjoyed having you here. Okay, before we wrap up then, uh, now that he's finished his questions, now I've got some questions for you. Very good. And if you would just keep looking at okay. uh, Tom when you talk. Uh, going back to TCC, the beginnings of TCC, could you talk about the early, early years, uh, your involvement and some of the challenges uh, that you guys faced even get the college going and just uh, uh, just talk about, you know, and kind of work through a little bit of the campuses up to Northwest uh, as far as your involvement and then how it kind of progressed from, you know, the college even just came about. And Much of the work and getting the college started, or getting the idea out there, getting a legal uh, framework, uh, a formation of a district in Votica tax uh, base, <clears throat> much of that was done uh, a few weeks before I got there. And, uh, but that didn't solve all the problems. The problems began, the detailed problems began, we began planning and construction and uh, getting the college open, getting a faculty. Uh, at that time, the nation was building about, on the average, about one new community college a week. And uh, there was big demand for faculty members and, and administrators. And uh, so getting, a, first of all, assembling a staff that I thought was appropriate for, for Tarrant County and for appropriate for the kind of institution we wanted to develop, uh, we began selecting faculty from anywhere, all over the country. Uh, we had uh, certain positions. I had one, one idea that I needed, a, for example, a chief business officer who knew Texas law, who knew Texas finance, and could come in and, and have that background behind him and found that in C.A. Robertson. Uh, so that was, putting that first faculty of 100 together was a great experience. Loved every minute of it. And uh, just as a little sideline, uh, in 1961, I hired a young man out of Ball State University, side and scene. Only person I ever si uh, hired without an interview, as far as I know. And uh, hired him in Fort Lauderdale. He came down, he taught art. I left. He went back to graduate school later. And on the first list of faculty members that came across my desk in 1966, as we were getting staffed up, was the name Will Kern. And, uh, you may know Will, he retired a few years ago, but he, he taught art on the South Campus all these years. But that was really a great challenge and a, and a great, uh, uh, we're just really a lot of fun of assembling the faculty and staff. We ran into minor problems, really, it turned out to be minor problems. Uh, we had uh, construction problems a few times. We, we had uh, a few strikes along the way. Uh, getting the, the, the South Campus, was probably one of the best organized of all of our construction projects. We had uh, a local contractor, we had local architects, good weather, and uh, got that campus open in, well, in, in, in uh, September 65. Northeast was a different problem. We got up there, we had a, a strike. It held up the uh, construction several weeks, uh, maybe several months, but uh, we got it open and uh, saved money on uh, uh, construction costs enough to, I think, to build a swimming pool. So those kinds of things came along. We had uh, 
very few, we have some people in the community who were not too enthusiastic about the college, I suppose, and they had a lot of questions, but we were able, we were able to cope with them and answer the questions to their satisfaction. I faced some, a few uh, pretty uh, hostile audiences, but not, not very many. We just, just missed most of that. But uh, we had a few personnel problems. In hiring as many people we did, we made a few mistakes. And uh, nobody's fault really, just people that did, did not fit into what we were uh, trying to do. And so had to take some, some uh, pretty severe uh, drastic steps in those cases. But uh, the Northeast, uh, had we had traffic problems up there, but we found great cooperation between North Richmond Hills and Hearst and the other area cities. They all just pitched in and, and solved any problem. When we uh, <clears throat> built the Northeast, uh, it, it was in two cities. It was a 185 acre campus which we bought, uh, had been a former horse farm. And uh, we began planning the campus and it, uh, we had to go to Hearst and North Richard Hills and say, hey, uh, can, we, can we shift the city line one way or the other? Put us all in Hearst or in, all in North Richard Hills. And they both wanted the college. So they said, you go ahead and ignore the city limit line. Plan your buildings, locate them wherever you want, and then when you get through, we'll draw the city limit boundary line down through the campus, which they did, and it goes something like that, I'm sure. They may have moved it <laughs> since in the, to miss the building, I'm not sure. But we just had great cooperation in solving problems like that. Utilities, uh, uh, they went all out to uh, perhaps uh, enlarge a, a sewer line or, or uh, do whatever's necessary to, uh, to help solve the problems. The Northwest campus uh, was, uh, was a gift. Even before we had begun uh, construction on South and Northeast, the Walsh family had approached the board and said, if you want a, uh, a campus in the Northwest, we have land up there, ranch land, on around Marine Creek Lake. And uh, we'd be glad to give you uh, land for campus. Well, I had, when I first arrived there, I had written specifications for a campus assuming a uh, student population of 5,000 full-time student equivalents, commuter campus, all the things that go along with, uh, with And we decided that the minimum size of a campus would be 150 acres. So the Walshes gave us 150 acres there on the shores of uh, Marine Creek Lake. But then we ran into a problem when the site development began. The engineers looked at that because 40 acres of the 150, 30 or 40, fell within the 100-year flood stage. And we couldn't build on, on that property, uh, couldn't build public, public buildings and, or any kind of buildings. So we ended up with 100, uh, a lot, lot, lot less land than 150 acres, about just, just over 100. So we went back to Walsh's and uh, both Mr. and Ms. Walsh, Howard and Mary D., wonderful people, uh, in a conversation with them, we explained that we couldn't build on that, that we needed more land. Well, I don't know whether any of you knew Howard Walsh or not, but he's one of the world's greatest guys, but he could, he could grumble at you. And uh, he was uh, kind of grumbling around about, well, we gave you 150 acres. <laughs> and Mary D. said, Howard, shut up. You know we're going to give it too many. <laughs> So we got the additional 40 acres, of about 40 acres, for that campus that came out, 100, I think it's 130 acres. But it was that kind of cooperation we had. And uh, so uh, uh, we did have some problems uh, on that campus. There's a, a quarry a mile away over there somewhere. And we, were, we felt the, the, the soil there, or the, the, the fiscal structures, is solid rock under there. And we were getting vibration through that uh, that we thought we were losing some windows, things of that sort. And uh, went to the people in the quarry and they agreed to cut down on the size of their blasting over there for a while until we could uh, uh, find the root cause of it. So it, uh, the problems that uh, we faced uh, 
were huge one day, but seemed to be always solvable and, and uh, relatively easy. Was there anything that influenced what what specific programs went on the campuses? Like, like South has the nursing program, and the Northeast has some of the med medical uh, uh, auxiliary programs, and 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 Northwest has has the uh, horticulture. And were there d decisions on on trying to yes. decide what programs? Went yes, there? every one of those we spent a lot of time on. Every one of those location of programs was always a a, a big problem. Not a, yeah, not as a big problem. You could make some decisions fairly easy. At the time we opened the South Campus, the associate degree, nurse, degree nursing program was still very new. Uh, I had begun one in Florida about the third or fourth year. That program was started really under the auspices of Columbia University with a grant from the Kellogg Foundation because it, 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 some people thought that in two years you could develop great bedside nurses, registered nurses, uh, without a full baccalaureate degree program. And it would prove to be true. And uh, I started the program there, and I wanted to start one in Fort Worth, and of course the hospital wanted to start one in Fort Worth. And uh, so we included that planning on the South Campus for the nursing program to get it up and open, because we didn't know how long it would be before we got the Northeast open. Uh, the... Uh, I might say about the, the, the nursing program, uh, every, every community with hospitals wanted it. And we had great support from uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council, both the Dallas County Community College and too. And so we started that program in the very early stages and put, and put it on the South Campus for that reason because that was the, place, the only place we had open. Uh, when it came to mapping out the other Allied Health Programs. Uh, we decided to move it uh, into the Northeast, and uh, that's why all of those uh, came off on that campus. Dental hygiene, and of course uh, all the radiology technology, and the, I'm sure they have a dozen or more up there now. And that uh, decision was made uh, to locate it there. It was closer to other hospitals than those just in Fort Worth. That was always a problem. Uh, well, there's always a consideration. We had the, the programs. North uh, Texas State College for Women uh, had a nursing program. Tarleton came in with a, a program in uh, uh, physical therapy. And we used the, the Fort Worth hospitals as uh, for, for clinical training. And it was very easy. We had, we had a coordinating committee that View, reviewed every allied health program we had to see if we had the clinical facilities in the area available to take our students. And, uh, for example, before uh, Tarleton came in, uh, in in the later years, that was there, to start its uh, uh, physical therapy baccalaureate degree program, I had to sign off on it. We did. It's okay. And uh, Dr. Margie Peschel was uh, our key leader in, uh, in coordinating all that. So that was always a problem, and that's one of the reasons we moved the, the Allied Health Programs to the Northeast, because there are hospitals in that area, too, and that could uh, take our students. The uh, horticulture program, we had land uh, up there that uh, was wide open, could be used to, to expand that program, and uh, in the construction we built the first uh, uh, greenhouses and, and began the program there. We did another thing that uh, I, I'm not sure should exist now, but Dallas was coming along at the same time we were. They had adapted the downtown department store and opened in 1966. Bill Priest was the president, and Bill and I had countless telephone conversations over the years about our programs. And in 19, probably late 60s, early 70s, uh, the two boards, Dallas and, and college college boards, Dallas College and the Tarrant County College Boards, adopted an agreement which says that any Dallas County resident who wishes to come over to Tarrant County to take a program not offered in Dallas uh, can do so and be treated just like a resident student and uh, for, for, for fee purposes and for admission requirements. And that meant that Bill and I were not having to uh, 
beat each other as to who can duplicate this vote. If he really, if his constituency was saying, we want a program in aviation technology, he could say, look, we're not ready for it, but if you go over to Tarrant County, they'll treat you just like a Tarrant County resident. And we did that for, you know, for a number of years. Renewed the contract every two or three years. One of the better things we ever did in, in, in coordinating. Uh, whose idea, or, or how did the, the fire academy and the police academy uh, come about on the Northwest campus? The, uh, the police academy, there was a police academy run by the North Central Texas Council of Governments, I believe it's called, may still be there, I'm not sure. They began a police academy for the cities the county, uh, and, and the county, and the cities did not have a police academy. Arlington had a police academy. Fort Worth had a very fine police academy. And so their problem solved. But what you have, 30 municipalities, and uh, they needed training. And so North Central Texas Council government started the police academy. But they at first got federal money, I'm sure, maybe continue to get some, but as their costs went up, they had to start charging more and more of, uh, well, Castleberry and whatever else would be around to train their officers. And so several of the police departments came to me and said, would you start a police, could you start a police academy? Well, the first solution was that, <clears throat> and in the North Central Texas Council of Government uh, agreed to this, that we would take over their program. But uh, we, over the years, I had many people who wanted me to take over their program. And it was one that we could not justify uh, financially, meeting the terms of their requirement, if we took it over. Uh, really, all it would amount, amount to, basically, would, we'd give them space to run their program on, you know, in our facilities. And uh, we would not agree to that. And so we began our own program using voluntary instructors, which caused me some little anxiety. And uh, we located up in that area because there were a lot of small towns around that, that part of the county in the northeast area. And uh, I never doubted after the first year, when the first students went to Austin to take their exam to become police officers, we knew I never worried after that because they, they just aced the test right down the line. And uh, the, uh, the academy really thrived. We brought a young man from, I believe, from uh, Midland to head the program. And so when we needed a facility, we had to use uh, firing ranges where we could find them. And uh, with the way the county was developing, uh, you use a firing range for this class, and by the t next time when you have a class to go through the firing uh, training, uh, you get there, there, it's filled with condominiums. And so you had to go someplace else. And that's when we decided to build a facility on Northwest. We had plenty of land, and uh, uh, so we put the, put the campus on that. There was plenty of land not only to uh, build the firing range and the, the classrooms and so on, we also had land room there for the driving pad, which took up a lot of space. And uh, the agreement was then, I'm sure it still exists, most of the instruction was done by uh, training officers of uh, uh, police departments, voluntary. Then we, we swapped them time in the range uh, for their instruction. So it was really a, a kind of a barter system with the early years of the police academy. I was really amused the other day reading the, the, uh, the Collegian. Uh, I noticed that they're thinking about closing in that range on the uh, northeast campus, but for fear there's a high school to be able to understand there that a stray bullet may go. <laughs> that was uh, not new news to me. I wanted to build an indoor range on that campus. And uh, so we looked all over the country to find a, a good example of somebody with a successful indoor range. And I discovered one in my old school down in Fort Lauderdale at, at Broward College. And I, I don't remember, I took three staff members 
And we flew to Fort Lauderdale to look at this indoor range, but while we were in the planning stage at Northwest Campus. And, uh, and it was pretty nice. Had 12 firing stations. And so uh, something didn't look quite right, and I, I asked the director, a man whom I'd hired years before to, to head the police academy there, I said, uh, how many people can you fire at one time? How many people can you Oh, we can only fire six, even though they had 12. He said, the air circulation system simply will not get those toxic fumes out fast enough. We came back home and we, we uh, planned the open range. Well, we were doing the, the uh, punch list. The building was completed. And uh, the architects, C.A. Robertson and uh, campus president, we were going through that. And I looked up in that range and I saw the, the girders across the range, they were made out of two and three inch pipe welded, of course round. And I could just see someone coming in there, getting off a high round, hitting one of those pipes, going up there, coming out and hitting somebody's car hood on the, on the, you're not going to hurt anybody probably, but he got a dent on the hood and we would have all kinds of trouble, trouble about a stray bullet. So I said, and I, I'm sure it's still there now. If you'll go look, I haven't looked. I came down to my ranch one weekend. I brought my 22 Magnum pistol. I brought a 38 Special, and I got some two by sixes. And I went out and I fired a few rounds and found. Of course, it went right through. I took the two by six back to C.A. Roberts. I said, uh, Mr. Roberts, I want you to get the architects, and I want you to face those girders with two by six. That will slow up a bullet enough. It's not going to go out there. It's not going to hurt anybody, but uh, it can be. It could hurt our public relations. So I was really amused to see that the same problem is still there. That uh, there might be a stray bullet. Now, I hope they get it resolved. But that was the, uh, the why we had the the, the uh, range up there. We had open space. The whole country was open then. The noise from firing wasn't going to hurt bother anybody. Of course, that changes. Just like the old ranges we had to use uh, out uh, the dirt bank somewhere, it became uh, a condominium or parking uh, shopping center. Uh, one last question. Uh, your relationship with Dr. Bell. Yes. Because it was such a long, right. I mean, he was the, I guess he was the president of the, uh, of the board the whole, almost the whole time you were uh, chancellor. The Jenkins Garrett was the first president of the board. And President Boyd, when they hired me in 1966. And uh, Jenkins served for six full years. He, they drew for terms. And so his term, he drew the term of six years and served throughout the uh, six years. And really, uh, I give him more credit than almost anybody else in the way the board shaped up in terms of its responsibility and actually. Uh, I'm not exactly confessing to three of you, but uh, to the television camera here, that uh, they gave me a lot more authority and freedom than uh, I had any right to expect. I tried to respect that, and I think that uh, I was fairly successful in doing so. I never, never infringed on that. But Jenkins was the one who really brought about the development of the, the way the board worked. At the end of the six years, he did not, did not run for re-election because the governor wanted him to be on the board of Regents University of Texas. He took that job. And uh, that's when uh, uh, Dr. Bell became chairman. And from that point on, we, uh, we worked very, very close together. Had a great relationship. I have uh, two questions, if I can. Can you articulate the uh, course directed to these guys here? Your answer. Can you articulate the opposition that was to a junior college in Tarrant County um, and the naysayers? The the opposition the, uh, to the form formation of the college. Mm -hmm. uh, it was there. Yes, it was organized. Uh, not so much opposition uh, in terms of a big opposition, but there were some people who were very sensitive about the college. I think that perhaps uh, 
faculty members at the existing universities had some concern. And uh, Texas Christian University, and I had a great relationship with Texas Christian, and, then, and uh, they had some concerns because they had a very big evening program, which they operated fairly economically. It was a, it was a financial uh, asset to them, and they could see a new community college coming along could wipe out their freshman sophomore classes with five dollar per hour uh, uh, tuition. And uh, so I hardly would describe that as opposition but concern. I think there was some concern expressed at University of Texas Arlington. Maybe not exactly in the same way, but uh, in some of their lower division, uh, departments of predominant lower division. So that atmosphere existed. I don't know of anybody who uh, openly came out and objected object to the college uh, because it was going to cost more, to, more money, because it was going to be relatively small. And then uh, very interesting things happened. Dr. Magruder Sadler was chancellor of Texas Christian University, and Dr. Lau Son was president of Texas Wesleyan. And in the campaign, they both came out and publicly endorsed the formation of the college district. And that was a great asset. Uh, instead of coming out against it, they endorsed it. Now, in, in fact, when we did open and open our mm -hmm. evening program, uh, particularly after the first year, we got the evening program up and operating, uh, TCU pretty much closed down. It's, its lower division uh, courses, but there were, all, <clears throat> there were also some people who wanted to, who ran a separate slate of officers, at Kansas officers for the Board of Trustees. And if you have that book that uh, uh, Don Kennard put together, I think it's described in there. And several prominent people, uh, particularly in the African American community, uh, were pl placed on the board, good people. Uh, a dentist, uh, I remember was, was one of them, and uh, they appeared on the ballot. Uh, but uh, the six people who were being promoted by, I'd say, the uh, community college committees that uh, had been formed, uh, they, they won the election. Uh, but it didn't take long for, for those uh, people who were running in opposition to them to, to come around, we had, had a great relationship with them. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the wife of that dentist who was one of the first candidates uh, was on our faculty for many, many years. Great faculty member. You, the South Campus came up at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. Did you guys have any civil rights issues, or did, was that something you guys had addressed before the opening of enrollment of campus? Actually, in, in, in the civil rights issues of that time, and they were, they were, they were very much uh, in the picture, the city of Fort Worth had done a great deal uh, to face that issue before a lot of other cities did. Uh, the uh, restaurants downtown were open. Uh, before we came into existence. And uh, now I, fa I did face some, some very serious questioning in, in the uh, African American community for church groups about what the college would be doing to face those issues. And uh, from the very start, we had very little in the way of, uh, of questioning or, or any, any conflict. Now later, and this was more, I think, student activity than it was racial. Uh, we did face an issue, and we're, we're in court. Uh, I was over in uh, South Carolina with a college over there uh, as a consultant one time uh, talking about this same issue when I got a telephone call from, uh, t from Fort Worth, from the president of South Campus, saying we'd had a fire in the student center and some student uh, uh, unrest and uh, a little bit of uh, turmoil on campus. It wasn't a great deal. And uh, I came home immediately and, and uh, 
some students had uh, had protested. We had, I think there was an organized campaign at one time on the part of uh, some national group that placed a student or two in our South Campus that were there to create problems for the, for the faculty members. And uh, this was an outgrowth of all that. Well, we immediately got the, a temporary restraining order against the students who had started the fire and uh, had uh, created uh, some disturbance on campus. And then the students, uh, the group, and I'm not sure who represented them, uh, took us to court, in, in district court, and uh, accused us of denial of their constitutional rights of expression, whatever. The case went to trial, and uh, we got a resounding uh, decision on the part of the, the district judge uh, in favor of the college. Uh, they appealed to the uh, appeals court, and the appeals court upheld that even with a stronger ruling. And it went to the state Supreme Court, and I believe the state Supreme Court heard the case and came down with a ruling in our favor. And that pretty much solved that uh, the problem we had with that. But uh, other than just minor things, uh, the, 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 the issue of, of civil rights. Now, during the Korean, uh, during the uh, Vietnam War, uh, we had a few little uh, demonstrations, uh, not uh, of any great significance. Uh, perhaps uh, all of the uh, gathering around the flagpole when their assembly point was supposed to be, things like that. It, it didn't uh, well, amount to a great deal. I think we're very, very fortunate to, to have had uh, gotten through that period with relatively little uh, turmoil and conflict. Anything else you want to know? He covered, he asked the last question I was going to ask oh, okay. about Vietnam and, and the civil rights movement. Yeah. You opened that campus, it was right in the midst of all that. Mm -hmm. and I was yes. Wondering, yeah.